Thank you. Well, good morning to all of you. We're just uh, getting a few minutes late started here, but we had some technical difficulties, I think, upstairs, and I understand they went and checked our technology out, and uh, the test come out negative for the virus. <laughs> so we're in good shape. By the way, I wanted to uh, suggest to you that in uh, today's time for six or eight months and the future we don't know, it's really easy to get irritable with this stuff going on. And when you do find yourself in that position, let me suggest you just find a seat, sit down, talk to your Lord, and count your blessings. And I think that might pick your day up. So when you find yourself in, the, in that position, give that a try. So good to have our visitors with us. We do have some here, and thank you for joining us to worship our living God this morning. Uh, we welcome you back anytime you get back in town. So thank you for joining us. It's good to see all of you. We have a nice crowd here this morning. Let's begin our worship service with a prayer. Father, we come before you, and indeed, if we just stop and be quiet and count our blessings, then we indeed see that we have this wonderful blessing of a living God that blesses our lives daily. And Father, you have blessed us so much with the hope that we have in your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, as we offer our praises up into you, as we offer our petitions of prayer to you this morning, we ask that you bless our lives, you ask that our, you bless this worship service this morning. And again, we just thank you for the love that we have in you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. As we come before Christ and remember him in communion, I'd kind of like to remind us of who Christ really was. And I'll read from 1 John 1, 1 through 9. In the beginning was a word, and the word was with God. The word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made. In him was life, and that life was the light of man. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning in the light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the living water. He's a prince of peace. He's a king of kings. And we remember him now as we partake of communion. In Matthew 26, or chapter 26, verse 26, Jesus was talking to his disciples at the 
Passover they had. And while they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body. Shall we pray? Our most holy and precious Father who art in heaven, we thank you for the gift that Jesus has given us, that we might be brothers with him, that we might be reconciled to you. We just pray now that we partake of this bread in a manner pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. After breaking of the bread, Jesus, in, chapter, in verse 27, then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many of this fruit of the vine for the forgiveness of sin. Shall we pray? Our Father who art in heaven, we thank you for the blood that Jesus shed for our sins. We pray now that we might remember him and his glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Good morning. Let's sing praises to God together. I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. I'm in the glory and the way. Telling the world that Jesus saves today. Yes, I'm in the glory and the way. Yeah. 
God gives the opportunity to express and encourage faith in Jesus Christ our Lord. True faith is the combination of trust and obedience in our relationship with God. The writer of Hebrews tells us we can't please God without faith. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Faith brings certainty and reality to what we can't see with our physical eyes. The heart that sings with faith allows trust in God to grow. Through faith, we depend on God in difficult times and show our confidence in Him. In his book, A Song is Born, Robert Taylor tells the story of D.B. Towner and J.H. Samus. D.B. Towner had been leading singing in Massachusetts in 1886. A young man came forward when an invitation was extended and said, I'm not quite sure how, but I'm going to trust and I'm going to obey. Struck by the young man's comment, Mr. Towner wrote down the phrase, trust and obey. He sent it to his songwriting partner, J.H. Samus, who wrote a poem that made up the lyrics that we sing now. After this, D.B. Towner wrote the tune, but wadded it up and threw it away unsatisfied. Later, his wife was cleaning his study and saw the thrown away hymn and sang it several times. She laid it back out for him to see again and asked him why he'd thrown it away. She told him she thought the melody was great for sharing the message of the song. Her advice was good. Trust and obey has become a very well-loved hymn. In Robert J. Morgan's book, Then Sings My Soul, he tells the story of songwriter 
Henry Francis Light. Henry preached in England and often wrote sermons, poems, and hymns where he walked trails in his beautiful surroundings. Henry struggled with a very serious lung condition and he had developed tuberculosis. In 1847, he preached what was going to be his last sermon. He had planned to take a trip to Italy for therapeutic reasons and had expressed the need to put his affairs in order. That day, he prayerfully walked along the coast and he went to his room and he came out later with a poem. As he began to travel, he revised it some more and sent it to his wife. Later that year, with the news of his death, his son-in-law held his memorial service. During his memorial service, the hymn, Abide With Me, was sung publicly for the first time. Will you stand for the reading of God's word? Our reading today is taken from Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 25. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, but not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself would be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up into the very present time. Not only so, but we ourselves 
who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption of sonship and the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. But hope that is seen is actually no hope at all. But if we hope for what we do not have yet seen, then we wait patiently. Be seated. Good morning. If you were here with us last Lord's Day, then you will know that Cody Gonzalez put his Lord on in baptism right after our services are, were over with. And uh, we have a servant towel for Cody. This is uh, something we give anytime someone is baptized into the Lord and added to the body by God. Or if someone moves here uh, already a part of the body and want to be a part of this particular congregation, we have a servant towel for them. And so, Cody, here is your servant towel. That was just a little bit short. Actually, that was my fault. I hit him in the hands, and so that was my, that was my bad. That's not true. A little bit short. <laughs> Some of y'all didn't get that at all at first. I had to repeat it. If you haven't met Cody yet, if you cross paths with him outside after services, just welcome him to the family. And he is... Uh, Involved in his first 40 day study. That's a study that we give to someone who's baptized into Christ, uh, patterned after those 40 days that Jesus was tempted in the wilderness after his baptism. And so it gives uh, the newborn babe in Christ something to do in Bible study for 40 solid days. And he's a, a week into his study and doing well with it. Well, are you ready for a word from God this morning? Wait. Well, not just wait, but wait well. Life is, it's just filled with opportunities to wait, isn't it? And sometimes, at least initially, that waiting can be filled with some excited anticipation. I remember in the, in the military, we had kind of a running joke. You hurry up and wait. You ever heard that one? You hurry up and you wait. And again, sometimes, at least initially, there can be some anticipation in that waiting. But a prolonged period of waiting can bring about questions. It can bring about doubting and ultimately even produce frustration. And so patience truly is a virtue, but not just a virtue. It is, it is listed among the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, isn't it? Love, joy, peace, patience. Patience is one of those manifestations of the Spirit in your life as a believer. And we know the Bible talks a lot about how character and strength are developed in our lives through that patient endurance. Oftentimes, God pushes the pause button in our lives in order to accomplish His purposes for our lives. Now, I want to repeat that one again. Oftentimes, God pushes the pause button in your life in order to accomplish His purpose for your life. There is perhaps no better example of what I'm just talking about than the minor prophet Habakkuk. If you know the story of Habakkuk, you know there's just three short chapters in that book. 
And in the very first chapter, Habakkuk is simply asking the question, how long? How long? And in context of what Habakkuk is asking, you know he's asking God, how long are you going to put up with your people in their rebellion against you? And as they continue to reject you, how long are you going to tolerate them and not punish them and not have them suffer consequences for what they're doing? Well, in that very same chapter 1, God will begin to explain to Habakkuk, I'm doing things that you don't see. I'm doing things that you can't believe. I'm doing things that if you knew about them, you wouldn't be able to handle it. And indeed, when God reveals what He was doing, that He was preparing the Babylonians to come and conquer Israel as consequences for their rejection, then Habakkuk has all kinds of problems with that as well. But in chapter 2, Two, in verse 3, towards the end of verse 3, God says to Habakkuk, even though it linger, wait for it. Wait for it. Have y'all, have y'all heard that term being used in our culture today where someone will say, wait for it, wait for it. Solomon was right in Ecclesiastes. There is nothing new under the sun. That's not something just happened recently. God said that to Habakkuk way back in this day and time. Habakkuk, wait for it. Wait for it. And then in Habakkuk chapter 3, Habakkuk concludes in verse 16, I will wait patiently and he goes on to say i'll even rejoice in the lord and i'll be joyful in my savior so in in some respects habakkuk is saying not only am i going to wait i'm going to wait well i'm going to rejoice while i'm waiting i'm going to be joyful while i'm waiting now let me also hasten to say this so that you don't have to wait for me to say this waiting does not mean sitting around doing nothing. But it does mean that you do not go outside of God's parameters when you decide to start doing something. I'm going to repeat that one again. Waiting does not mean sitting around doing nothing. But it does mean you don't go outside of God when you start doing something. I have two great examples of that. Do you remember in Exodus chapter 32 when Moses has gone up on Mount Sinai and God's people are waiting for him and he doesn't come back very quickly? Do you remember what God's people decided to do as they waited? Build a golden calf. And this is amazing. When you go back and reread that account, do you remember who who was the one that built it for them? Aaron. Aaron. He's the one that said, okay, give me your your earrings and... uh, your jewelry, and and I will fashion this golden calf and we will worship it and sacrifice to it as the one who brought us up out of Egypt. Now, stay with me for one more second regarding this story. In the very first verse, or around the first verse of Exodus chapter 32, they're saying to Aaron, we don't know what has happened to this Moses who brought us up out of Egypt. We don't know what's happened to him, but we're tired of waiting. And so build us an idol that we can sacrifice as the one who brought us up out of Egypt. 
We're going to give you our ear earrings. We're going to give you our jewelry. We're going to watch you melt it down. We're going to watch you fashion this beast. And we're going to worship what we've just witnessed you made as the one that brought us up out of Egypt. Make sense of that one. But you see, while they were waiting... The anticipation turned into questioning. And the questioning turned into doubting. And the doubting turned into frustration. And the frustration led them into going beyond God. You want another example of that? Tell me yes, because I've got another example. Okay. You are going to get it whether you wanted it or not. You know that, right? In Genesis chapter 16, Abraham is 86 years old. Now, remember in Genesis chapter 12 when Abraham first received the promise from God that he was going to have a son? Do you remember how old he was when that promise was initially made? He was 75 years old. 75 years old when God promised he was going to have a son. By the time you get to Genesis chapter 16, he's 86 years old. 11 years have transpired. And Abraham, in his waiting, goes outside of God. You remember what happened, right? Sarah gives her handmaid Hagar. And they have a son, Ishmael outside the parameters of God. And God explains that to him, and it would be later on in uh, Genesis chapter 21 when Abraham was 100 years old. Another 14 years would transpire before God's promise was fulfilled with the birth of Isaac. Sometimes, and I haven't done any kind of a scientific study on this, but sometimes how we wait can have some bearing on how long we wait. And so the challenge that God gives to us is wait well. I also love the book of James, where James gives us a, an interesting analogy. In James chapter 5, verses 7 through 11, he talks about the farmer. Beginning in verse 7 of James chapter 5, Be patient then, James says, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and the spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. And the judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You've also heard of Job's perseverance. And you've seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion, and He is full of mercy. And so there in that brief few scriptures, James is using several different uh, examples there. Job's perseverance and patience. The prophet's perseverance and patience. And that of a farmer that has to persevere and has to be patient. Now, you may not have done any farming in your life, but perhaps relatives of yours have. Or maybe you've even done a little gardening in your life. And so even with that, you know the value of patience. You have to prepare the soil, and then you have to plant the seed, and then you have to water, and then you have to fertilize, and then you have to wait and watch if bugs or weeds start attacking. You have to take action to eliminate that, and then comes the harvest, then comes the reaping. But there is waiting Involved, And so James uses the farmer as that analogy. Do you realize in the life of Jesus how he waited? You go through his life, whether it's in Matthew's account or Mark's account or Luke's account or John's account, and see how often he says the phrase, My time has not 
yet come. Patient. God also is displayed as patient with us. In 2 Peter chapter 3, in verse 9, Peter says, The Lord's not slow in keeping His promises, or He's not slack in keeping His promises, as some people understand slowness. Instead, He, God, is patient with us, not wanting any of us to perish, but all of us to come to repentance. And so Jesus is patient. God is patient. And we've seen on a number of occasions how, how we are to be imitators of God. And so as they are patient and wait, we too are to be patient and wait. Go back to the example of Moses all the way back to Exodus chapter 14 because there are numbers of scriptures that talk to us about the importance of waiting. In Exodus chapter 14, the children of Israel have just uh, recently been released from their Egyptian bondage. Pharaoh has changed his mind. They're trapped against the Red Sea with the Egyptian army closing down on them. They begin to complain and saying it would have been better for us to have never left Egypt. It would be better for us to have been left alone. But look at verse 13 of Exodus chapter 14. Moses answered the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see now today, you will never see them again. Look closely at verse 14. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to do what? Just be still and wait. That reminds you of that beautiful psalm, doesn't it? And we even sing a song, Psalm 46 and verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. So many other passages. Look over to Psalm 27. In Psalm 27 and verse 14. The psalmist there says, wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. I love the 130th Psalm in verses 5 through 8 of Psalm 130, a couple of different times here. I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits and in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord. More than the watchman wait for the morning. More than the watchman wait for the morning. I made an allusion a moment ago to the military. If any of you guys ever served in the military and you did one of those night watches, you know how eagerly you're waiting for the morning, right? You're waiting for the morning. And that's what the psalmist is saying here. Even more than that, more than the watchman wait for the morning. Israel Put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with Him is full compassion. He Himself will redeem Israel from all of their sins. There is redemption at the end of that waiting. And so the journey might not always be easy, but the arrival is worthwhile. That's the passage that Keith read just a few moments ago in Romans chapter 8. The journey is not always going to be easy. There are sufferings that are going to be endured. There's afflictions that are going to be endured. But they are not worthy of being compared with what God has prepared. So even though the journey might not be easy, the arrival is going to be worthwhile. Two other passages from the prophet Isaiah quickly. Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 18 Yes, the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up and he will show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. And then maybe the most familiar passage out of the prophet Isaiah is Isaiah chapter 40, verses 28 through 31. Do you not know? Have you not heard the Lord is the everlasting God? He's the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, 
and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary, and he increases the power of the weak. Even youths will grow tired and weary, and young men will stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord, some versions use the word wait, those who wait for the Lord will renew their strength, and they will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and yet never faint. And so the word that God has for us today, the word that God has for you today, is wait well. Not just wait, but wait well. When Paul was writing to the church in Rome, in Romans chapter 12 and verse 12, he gives three real succinct challenges. Be joyful in hope. Be patient in affliction and be faithful in prayer. Brothers and sisters, if you go away from here remembering nothing else, those three challenges will do you well in waiting well. Be joyful in hope. Be patient even in affliction and be faithful in prayer. Remember, there will be times where God will push the pause button in your life, but it's for a purpose. Wait well through that purpose and allow His purposes to be accomplished in your life, knowing that you don't just sit around doing nothing, but as you're waiting, don't go outside the parameters of God and feel like you need to help God. It didn't work for the children of Israel. It didn't work for Abraham, and it won't work for you. As a matter of fact, I think that's a tool that Satan uses. When God has us waiting, he's the one that creates the impatience. He's the one that creates the questions. He's the one that creates the doubting. He's the one that creates the frustrations. And the best thing you can do is resist the devil and he will flee from you. The best thing you can do is recognize him for what he is and what he's doing and say, get behind me, Satan, and be still and know that he is God. Remember the situation with our uh, distancing and the way we're handling our invitation. We will have a couple of our elders back uh, outside and as you exit, if you have any response, if you have any spiritual need or emotional need or physical need that you need to make known to this church, those men are ready to receive that. But let's continue on as we think about our giving and our going out for the rest of this day and waiting well. I want to remind all of you to be sure and look on your emails at Mary Jane's daily emails she sends out and uh, be reminded of all those who need to be lifted up in prayer and please do that this week. I have uh, one large announcement to make here before we dismiss and I think I will begin that announcement by asking you a question. What happens when you pick up your phone and you dial the Village Church of Christ number? Well, let me remind you. Ah, phone's ringing. The Village Church of Christ. This is Cindy Nyquist. How can I help you? For 15 years, Cindy Nyquist has taken our challenges and tasks that we request of her on the phone. She has taken our challenges and tasks that we request when we walk in the office door. 
For 15 years, Cindy has taken the daily needs, the weekly needs, the monthly needs of this congregation, and she has seen that those needs were fulfilled. For 15 years, Cindy has been on the staff here. And the next point is also large. For 15 years, Cindy has been a representative of the Village Church of Christ in our community. Cindy, would you stand? That's very well deserved. Cindy has chosen this morning for us or for her, her to be announced that Cindy will retire from her task in the church office as of September the 1st. So Cindy, may God bless your life in retirement. And we want you to know that the shepherds and every member of this body here hold a deep gratitude for you and how you have served this church in that capacity for the last 15 years. Thank you. Absolutely. The shepherds also would like to announce that Lisa Cobb, who has been working with Cindy and Kay and David and Chad in the office for some time, Lisa Cobb has agreed to fill that vacancy. And Lisa, thank you for doing that. I want to remind you as uh, we dismiss and we'll have a dismissal prayer and uh, to remain seated after the prayer and you will be dismissed row by row beginning in the back by the ushers. And I also want to remind you that uh, those collection trays are back there on the back wall and uh, let's remember God as we exit this building. Go out and be safe. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this service. Thank you for blessing our lives in the midst of trouble to be able to come here this day and worship you. Lord, we are reminded as we leave here how important the light of Christ is. Father, thank you as we go out and as we remember our blessings and we just thank you for Christ, the hope in him. And Lord, we ask you to bless our lives as we leave this building and keep us safe. In Christ's name we pray, amen.